really good at this. You could go to switch on. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I have a great honor to introduce Jennifer Delgado. I'm sure you all know her. Um, Jennifer got her, maybe I shouldn't say that, BS in, in physics in Mizzou. Um, but then she went to Minnesota, Twin City, University of Minnesota and Twin City, and got her PhD in astrophysics uh, in 2013. Uh, then she was hired by two of our prescient uh, people here, Barb and Phil, right after she graduated to lecture for us. She did that for a while. She lectured 114, 111, and 216. Um, she also, at the same time, uh, worked at Pascal and taught their equivalent of 111 and 211, 212. Um, then she came and she actually put together the first online courses that we ever did, 201, 202, which are these transitional things that take you from 114, 115 to 211, 212. Um, she became our lab director uh, in 2015. And now she has become an associate teaching professor in our department. Um, Jennifer is going to tell us what's the point of physics in general. Um, thank you, Hume, for that introduction. I hope to live up to even half of it. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you know me. I've been a lab director for a while. And some of you here are captive audience, unfortunately for you. You already know some of this sort of thing. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of what I've been doing for close to the last four years. Uh, because uh, as you'll see towards the end, there, there's been some research questions, actually, that have shown up in taking over this job. Not how I intended this to work out. Um, so a lot of things we'll talk about is sort of in a, um, Mostly it was done for the purposes of developing the lab, and then from that we started to find questions that no one knows the answer to yet. So first off, why should you care? Um, that I took the most cynical approach in doing this. I assume that most people care about time and money. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what students are giving up and what our TAs are giving up. We actually do invest as a department and as a college quite a bit of resources into our labs, and most of that goes back to the students. Students, we get about 1,100 of those or so a semester. If you think that they spend maybe an hour a week on their labs throughout the semester, they're going to spend uh, about 40 hours on this. They also have to pay, including the lab fees, the cost of the lab manual, and the tuition, a decent chunk of change for students. That revenue almost directly goes back into paying our TAs, who then teach those labs. Some of it goes into some of the summer salaries for uh, one TA a summer and some of Little, little piece of it goes into paying for me. So we're spending all this time and this money on something. So it'd be good to know that it's doing something that we care about as a department. So the questions that I have um, that I didn't start off with, honestly, when I started the job, but that have grown out of this is, so what's the point? What, what can a physics lab do? What value does this have for our students or for the um, people teaching it? So I've gone through some things. Can it teach content, physics content, lab skills, all the sort of things. What I'm going to talk about towards the end is how can you determine any of that. It, it's fun to say, you know, can, can labs teach skills and come up with things that you argue? Like, of course it can. But without some way of measuring some of this, uh, we're all just sort of making it up as we go. And we'd prefer not to do that. So this is an example of a traditional lab. And I'm going to use that phrase, traditional lab, every once in a while. And this is what I mean. This is an example of a lab manual that was used here at the University of Kansas before I was born. This is a conservation of momentum lab. And it's titled Conservation of Momentum. And it's talking about all the specific steps, the equipment that you'll need going through, basically do this lab. And it ends with some questions, including, is momentum conserved? I would be hard pressed as a student to see momentum conservation and answer this in a way that didn't tie back to that title. But traditional labs have this sort of format. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what you're supposed to be using. 
you basically are just going through this process of proving something in essence. You're trying to find something that you already know is true or find some value, say like g. So if you're calculating g, you know what that's supposed to be. And the idea behind this is that if students go through this experience, they go through some sort of process that thousands and millions of other physicists have gone through, then they will absorb this physics content that we all know should be in their heads. So they're basically trying to prove the reality of what students see in the lecture. This is what I mean by a traditional lab. Does it work? So what I'm going to show you is work that I didn't do. This is um, basically two big, work, uh, two big pieces of research that have been done just recently to try to answer this question that I didn't know about when I started the job. First one is this slide. This is from an um, article that showed up as a journal article in, uh, no, sorry, a popular article recently that a handful of you actually sent to me. And I say handful because I got it about 10 times. <laughs> what Holmes and Wyman, and that's Carl Wyman, yes, who got the Nobel Prize, um, and Holmes is not Cornell, his student. What they did is they said, can we take tests that students have gone through? And they took a couple of different tests and a couple of different courses, and this was the um, result of the replication study, actually. So this started with just one school. Let's take these tests that students have done, and we'll ask people who know something about the labs to sort through those tests and find the questions that are lab-related. Basically, they know these questions are going to deal with content that students have seen in the lab. And then we can sort through the questions that haven't had anything to do with the lab, and we can basically find some difference between how they answered those questions. So the fractional, um, the fraction of fractional questions they got correct in the lab ones versus the one they didn't for each student. You find that difference for each student, you average that, and then you see how that value changes based on whether or not a student was in a lab. So it should be that the students who were in the lab would do better on the lab-related questions, but they don't. Yeah? Does this take into account how well they actually did in the lab course? It, uh, they, they have some analysis like that, but no, this is kind of averaged overall things. That could be a good question. This thing here bothers a lot of people because if you're spending, as I said, all that time and all that money on doing this sort of thing, then you would expect some difference. You could probably track some of that. They haven't done that yet. And it is a, I did a little bit of it myself here. And I don't have access to all the test questions. And ironically, we don't have that many that I could use for the labs. But we did happen to have this one question that was given by Professor Fisher uh, two years ago in a 212 class. Basically, the question is asking them to find the uh, magnitude of an electric field given that you have some, I should say average electric field, given that you have two potentials and you have some separation distance between them. We do this as a lab. We've got this um, carbon paper. We paint it with silver paint. We attach two um, terminals to a power supply. So they have a potential difference of 12 volts, and there's some known separation distance. And the students go through the process of finding the value of the electric field. We should expect that students who are in the lab would do better on this question. They don't. This is not as sophisticated as the research that, that Wyman, and, and this is just a piece of an example. But they're not doing any better on these lab-related questions. They're not absorbing that content that we want them to learn from the labs. In addition to that, they have a cost. And I don't just mean the cost I was talking about earlier with time and money. They have a cost to how we are training students to think about science. This is done by work that's been led by Heather Landowski, and these are two the pieces from two pieces of paper. But she has this uh, assessment called the E-Class, and I forgot exactly what that acronym stands for. But it's basically a collection of questions that ask students their perceptions on how they think science is done. Like, what's the point of experimental science? One of these asks, the primary purpose of doing physics experiments is to confirm previously known results. So they get asked, how does this per student's perception of what science means, what's the point of science, change after they have gone through a lab experience? This concept section means the traditional labs. These are the labs like what I showed you, the one from before I was born. These kinds of labs actually lead to people thinking less scientifically because they see experiences like this, where they're in a, in a lab doing an experiment, proving things the way they should be proven. If instead you have labs that are a little more focused on, say, skills, you don't see this loss and potentially even see a gain in how students perceive the way that experimental science is done. I didn't know about any of this when I started. 
And instead, all I had to go on was students' um, reviews of the labs. So I started off with Bob's lab manual. In the first year I was here, I didn't touch anything. I just like, let's just run stuff the way it is. Uh, I didn't have any really tools to assess it other than student reviews. So when I looked at the student reviews from their TAs, I noticed there was a lot of discussion of clarity, understanding. I talked to Bob about this, and he said that he had specifically written the lab manuals so that there would be pieces missing from what students were going through, so they'd have to think about it. So they couldn't just do step, 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 step. I was like, well, that's why they're not getting things. That's why they don't, they don't know how to do anything. So I'm going to write a lab manual that tells them everything that they should do, every single step. And it was there. This is just two pages for one. These things went on. This was huge. Every single step was outlined for them. Anytime they had to do something, it told them what to do. Anytime they had to write something down, they got a place to write it down. I even have a spot down here that I circled because I find it really ironic now, which is have your TA check your answer, TA initials. So they went through an extreme sort of version of a traditional sort of lab, and they loved it. So what you're seeing here is how well they would recommend their TA. So overall, what was their experience of their TA, which is tend to, tends to tie their experience of the lab. One is perfect. So if you saw them down here, that means every student recommended um, all the TAs on average that we had. And right here, you can see for 2016, the year that I, this is just fall semesters, the year I, I made this, students loved this thing. They really, really liked it. They told me that this is so great. We'd have to know exactly all the steps to do. But I knew I couldn't just go off of basically the student evaluations. So I wrote these tests that in hindsight were kind of evil. Um, what I had them do is I handed them a spring. And I said, here's a spring. I'm going to give you some amount of mass after you've got to play with this spring for a little while. And you're going to tell me how far the spring stretches. The TAs reported mass panic. The students didn't know what data to collect. They didn't know why they had the spring. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. And no uncertainties were calculated at all. It was a nightmare. So I knew that even by just telling them step by step, do this, then this, then this, I was making them happy, but I wasn't, I wasn't giving them any of the skills even that they needed. I'm ignoring the content. They still weren't learning how to collect data in a reasonable way, how to find uncertainties in that, how to use it for any sort of useful purpose. Um, so that was upsetting. So then I, I went and I started trying to approach this in a sense of, at least a little bit more rigorously in terms of this is now kind of a research thing. It wasn't like when I teach a class where I can kind of see people's faces and go, yeah, you're enjoying this or getting this. I had over 1,000 students to try to figure out how to help them. So I went to the AAPT. In fact, the, the department paid for me to go. This is what they offer currently as the gold standard for what a physics lab should look like. If you look at this, you'll notice there's nothing on here about content at all. All of these are skills. The problem with this is that there's not a whole lot of specifics. This doesn't tell you do this at this time, or do, none of that. In fact, it's kind of like you know, some of the labs that they're encouraging us to do. So I came back to this. What can it do? Does it have any point? Is there any purpose? And is there any way to measure it? So this, this is the point where I started to ask, is there some sort of measurement tools that I can use, or is, can I develop measurement tools to try to figure out what the point of the lab is? I also did a lot of thinking. I went off to theory land and tried to figure out the things that I hated most about lab experiences and what I hated most about trying to talk to students. And I made this sort of list. Human error. You've all heard this. If you've taught a lab, if you've been a lab, you've heard students say the phrase human error. And it's almost at the point where I just hearing that phrase makes me twitchy. And it's not just because I think a lot of times it's written off as laziness. But I don't think it's just laziness on the part of the students. I think there's there's something hiding here that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but it's related to authority and failure. As Hume can tell you, I have a problem with authority, just kind of in general. But I have a problem with it as well in the labs. Because as we go back and we look, remember look at that traditional sort of labs, they're writing in bold what results you should get. And this, I would argue, makes for poor scientists. Scientists should be the kind of people who do question authority, not relentlessly but who do ask questions about why is this way or how did you find that and pick things apart. I also have a problem with this idea of no room for failure because as anyone in this room can tell you, failure is expected. You will go through processes that you think this will make sense, this will work, and it doesn't. It doesn't at all. But students don't really have this experience in the lab. So I'm going to give you an example. And there's Mr. Bob. This is a screenshot from the uh, lab that we do. It's a beautiful lab. In fact, it's a Nobel Prize winning experiment. It's the charge to mass ratio of the electron. A couple of summers ago, I ran this experiment um, 
where, and it was an experiment within an experiment on the suggestion of Professor Murray. So you notice I got down here the charge to mass ratio of the electron, and I said determine if the following charge to mass ratio is supported by your data. I lied. Digits are obsolete. There's more digits now. It's also wrong. It's also wrong. It's completely wrong. It's the wrong value. But I had it in bold. I didn't say this is what the charge to mass ratio is. I just asked students, can you figure out if your data supports this? There's only, there's only 30 to 40 students in this lab. And honestly, the results were really depressing for me. So I blurted out, but this is a student's comment, and I've written it over. This is the charge to mass ratio that they've got. And they, I'm giving you two examples of kind of some of the things we saw. So the average values are consistent, but the uncertainty values you calculated seem to be a bit off. This must be due to human error in calculation following the instruction of the TA. <laughs> I will not name names to let you know which TA this is, but it's not the TA's fault. We also have this, which again makes me sad. No, we might have had a few values that have gotten relatively close, but we don't have them instruments accurate, new, or nice enough to give us accurate and precise results. They would get us, and they wrote the whole thing out. They wrote exactly this thing. One student, one student out of that whole cohort used their cell phone and they wrote it on here. They used their cell phone and they typed it and they're like, the value you gave us isn't consistent with the best known value. One. I argue that this is happening because as an authority figure giving them in bold letters things, they're going to follow that. They don't have a lot of faith that they can do physics. They've been taught this way. This is how they have been trained in all of their science classes. We tell them what to use. We tell them how many times to measure using the thing. We tell them what formulas. And finally, as the authority, we tell them whether or not they're good. They follow this process for science. They start with the right theory and answer. They start off with labs titled conservation of momentum. Well, of course, I know what answer I'm supposed to get. Then they go through the experiment the right way, following exactly the step-by-step -step instructions. This is not at all is how experimental science is done. People don't hand you, well, sometimes for instruments they do, but in general they don't say, first you're going to do this and this, and make sure you measure six times. But what I really hate is this thing here at the end. At the end of a lot of labs, students go through this process where they come to you nervous and saying, I got this answer. Is this the right answer? And then you as the TA are either saying, yes, of course, good job, or no. But what they're learning from this, I would argue, is that they're learning is that there's an authority figure who decides what is truth and what is not truth. And this, to me, is antithetical to what science is. So I started trying to make modifications to the lab to reflect these big theoretical ideas I had for what was wrong with physics labs. One of the first things that I did is I, wanted, I was looking for a way to take that authority out of the picture. I didn't like the idea of the TA saying yes or no. So the only thing I could come back to is that I wanted data to be the authority. I wanted data itself to drive this. So what we ended up doing is similar to those sort of test finals that I had run. I ended up running labs where I basically say, here's your goal. Your goal is to find the spring constant so that if I give you this spring, you can accurately predict the displacement of that spring if I give you any mass. You're going to make, for me, quantitative predictions for what's going to happen with this system. You're going to calculate, for me, uncertainties on that value. And then we're going to test it. And we're going to see if this range that you have predicted reflects at all the reality of what happens when we measure it. So that way, it's not just the TA saying, mm -hmm. yay or boo. Students have to worry about uncertainty, and they have to worry about what's, what that system actually looks like. That brings me to failure, because failure is part of this. I designed the labs, and this is something we've kind of been just working last year, and this is on the suggestion of Professor Fisher under the alpaca style. And please, please don't ask me what the acronym is. I made it up, and I still don't remember. <laughs> the idea is that we have a handful of objectives, and objective three here is the prediction one. But you can try this out and fail a few times and get an A, even if you didn't get an average of an A. So if you make these predictions, you don't have to get them all correct. That's OK. Try again next week. And in fact, we restructured the labs. That's just started this last year. So that you don't do a lab experiment once and either fail or succeed. You do it a handful of times. And you see if, OK, well, I tried this, and that didn't work. I'll try some other thing. And OK, that might have worked a little better. And then you try it one last time. And you tell us, have you learned enough about that system that you feel that you can make some type of accurate predictions about how that system works? 
my hope with this is that students learn that failure isn't necessarily bad. I don't have a lot of way of measuring this yet. Um, th this is where I'm going to have to start getting digging deep into student surveys and student evaluations. But anecdotally, students tell me this is their favorite thing about the lab. They really like this. I think in part because it can help reducing, reduce anxiety of, well, it didn't work out that first week. I'll try it again. Something that we all go through. One of the problems with us, though, is that students can still end up with the wrong answer. Just like in real science, you have data, and even if everything you do is logical and is done to the best of your ability and is consistent with all, all the facts you have available to you at the time, you can still get an answer that ends up not being consistent with future experiments or even past experiments that you didn't know about. This can still happen. So then the question becomes, what's more important? We could have traditional labs where they never see anything wrong because we tell them exactly the way things are supposed to be. Or we could have less traditional labs where sometimes they're going to get the wrong answer. Sometimes instead of finding the relation that we expect from the system that they're studying, sometimes they find something a little different. That's going to be a cost to doing things this way. Sometimes they're going to see stuff that isn't right. In my mind, that is probably an OK loss if we see a gain on their epistemological beliefs. So if we start to see students believing that from data, I can create models. And from those models, I can attempt to understand something about the universe based off of the predictive power of that model over the idea that, well, you know, yeah, data could exist, but I know it's not the right answer, and it's not the right answer because of human error. I think that's worth it. You can disagree. That's OK. So this is a rough outline of the current form of the lab. Students are given broad goals. And, and I see that you can't read this now. The broad goal for this, so I changed it from, you know, here, just tell me what the speed of the projectile is, to I'm going to take a cup, and I'm going to set the cup here, and you're going to tell me where that projectile launcher needs to be in order to get it to launch the cup at any particular velocity setting. So tell me, how does it change with velocity? Tell me how it changes with height. Figure out how this system works. Once you have explored that parameter space and you feel like you understand it, you've got some sort of model with some type of uncertainties, so we'll test it. And we'll see how well things work. So how can we measure this? There's not a whole lot of ways, actually. Um, one of the things that we can use are student surveys. As we've seen, that those are kind of biased. They can't really tell us how well students are learning, but they can tell us whether or not they hated their experience, which I see as useful. I don't want them to travel through the labs and hate all of us. We also know something about their confidence in their ability to do physics experiments. And I think this, as I said before, relates back to the idea of human error. That if they just fundamentally believe that everything that they touch, all the data that they collect, is fundamentally flawed because they aren't a real physicist and they don't know really how to do this, then that, we're going to see that propagate through. And if we can measure somehow how that changes, then that could tell us something about how they're thinking about how they work as a scientist. Finally, there's E-class. Um, and I don't have results for this yet. They, they, their automated system screwed up. But we're going to get this very soon. This is that thing that I was talking about where they, they test how students' beliefs change. And I haven't gotten that just yet, unfortunately. So the PSC, Physics Self-Efficacy, is asking things like, I can complete physics activities. Or if I study, I will do well in a physics test. Or if I'm often able to help my classmates in physics with a laboratory and recitation. So this is basically, do you believe you can do physics? We gave this to students as a pre and a post just this last semester to see if we are getting this change in beliefs at some level about how students think. Good news is, probably yes, we are changing how students believe they can do physics. I've sorted it by gender because as you can see, there's a very big gap here. This is across all the labs, and this is their pre in blue and post in orange scores about how they believe. So any time that that question could be answered in a sort of negative way that points towards you not believing in your ability to do physics. I coded that negative, and any time it was positive, I coded that positive. Men start out in general significantly more confident in their ability to do physics than women. A lot of this that you're seeing comes from 114 in particular. So women in 114 don't think that they can do physics. Their score starts off really negative. It's a little better, better for women in the 200 level sequence, the calc-based ones, but still not great. 
And for women, we do see a statistically significant gain in their belief to do physics. Now, this is mostly just done for me to try to figure out internally what's happening with the labs. But for me, this is really interesting because this is completely different from the paper from which I got this survey. In the paper that I got, they actually showed that, and it wasn't targeted towards labs. It was targeted towards just the physics courses themselves. But they showed that women actually go negative. The lab, ex or sorry, the lecture experience, the being in a physics class actually makes women tend to believe less in their ability to do physics. So I, I find this really interesting and I intend to pursue this as a, as a research project and I've already been talking to some of the people at the Center for STEM Learning because this relates not only just to the physics labs but also in general how genders experience sort of our, our STEM classes. Um, this will tie into group work as well. Okay, so going back to this picture. I've made a color-coded diagram of all the things, all the skills that we focus on in labs. So some of the things are sort of how we're changing their belief structure, but if you remember on that balancing thing, we also have skills. All kinds of skills are going on here. There's the technical skills, so you've got stuff like using instruments and recording data, all the way over to things that I would argue are um, a little deeper related to how, how you reason about how experiments should be done. So the question is, how do we measure changes in students' skills to do these kinds of things? There are not a whole lot of options. For this, it's kind of easy. We can just say, did you do this, yes or no? Did you plot a thing, yeah. <coughs> For this, we've got labs now that can um, tell us some of this. Can they make quantitative predictions? So this is those tests that I mentioned, the terrible, awful tests that students went through. What I've got plotted here is their score versus the fraction of students with that score. TAs are given specific instruction related to this final, which is that students don't get a perfect score unless they got their prediction with an uncertainty correct. You can give them all the sympathy points you want up till that point, but you can't give them 100% unless they got it correct. These lines that you're seeing here are from the labs that we ran with that hyper-specific, very traditional format. I gave them all the information. You'll notice very few of them were able to do their prediction correct. We got a lot of sympathy points, but very few of them were able to get to the point where they could come up with a model, use that model to make some type of quantitative prediction, and on top of that, propagate uncertainty so that they had a range that would give them accurate results. The following year, when we started doing a little bit of these pieces, so I still didn't have the, um, they didn't have the repeat labs at this point, but we did have the quantitative predictions we saw a pretty dramatic increase in the fraction of students that were able to get their prediction done accurately. What I think this means, is it could mean two things. One, we're making better scientists, or two, I've just trained them to do a specific thing. That's an option. It could just be by making them constantly go through this process of collect data, make me a model, make predictions over and over again. They've gotten to the point where, yes, they can do it, but they still don't have any deeper understanding of it. But at least they're doing it. This part is the part where it gets more challenging. So the pieces in here are, are harder to test. So um, what I'm going to start getting to now is some of the work that um, uh, has been done at Cornell to try to understand this. But I'm also going to start getting into some of the work that we, I started a few years ago that is now developing into kind of a real research project. So I've got them in yellow, and that's because they're not done yet. So the first one here is called the PLIC. Again, please don't ask me. I don't remember acronyms really well. But this is the one that's being done at Cornell. And it, it's, it's really asking, can you make well-reasoned choices about models? And this is one that we gave last semester to students to try to see if our labs were having any effect on their ability to reason well when it comes to looking at others' work with related to physics. So the ah, physics laboratory, inventory of critical thinking. So there's some experiment that they've got where basically they've got a mass and there's a spring uh, that is attached to the mass and they're given some relations and they're asked basically to compare two different ways of approaching this experiment. Student answers are graced, graded on similarity to expert answers. So this is the part where it's still a lot of work is being done. Um, so when I talked to, to um, Natasha about this, she was saying that they're having still a lot of trouble with this because people will go and take the tests that arguably are just making stuff up as expert answers. So they're still weeding through kind of how to do this. But what they do is they compare how your students are doing to these expert-like answers and give you some change towards expert-likeness. So what you have here is you have two different um, methods of doing this. 
or sorry, well, this is one method of doing this first method where you have uh, just 30 grams that you put on the spring and you're measuring the period for um, five oscillations and you're seeing how that changes over 10 of these. This one you only had 50 grams and you do this. So this is one way that you could find that, that spring constant. Just measure at two different masses and really, really nail down what that period looks like at those two different masses. <coughs> Obviously just testing at two different masses doesn't work so well. You've only got those two places. So an increase in the number of students who want to test more masses is a good indication that they're getting that, hey, there could be a parameter space here. That you know, just testing these two places may be poor. You'll notice that our students actually start off pretty small in terms of how much expert-like thinking they have compared to similar classes. I'm not sure how strongly to take that. Right now, for this, they have very small sample sizes still. And for ours, it's even smaller. We had, I think, on the order of 40 or so students complete each of these. And they're sitting around a couple of hundred students that they've got. So it's something that's still be developing. But at least we can take a positive indication that there is some thinking going on, some kind of growth. The other thing that I like is that then the next example, the other experiment that students were asked to evaluate, you see this plotting of the, the period squared versus the mass. And you should expect a linear relation. And when you look at a residual, you get this sort of doohickey. And your students are asked to exp a figure out, evaluate what, how good they think this experiment is based off of a couple of parameters. And one of those that you can, little boxes you can click is how close are the results to what the um, expected relation is, what the model predicts. And you can see that we have a decrease, which is good. Before then, a lot of our students were arguing that basically if it's there in the model, that should be what you should get. If the, the bolded word tells you that this thing should be aligned, that thing better be aligned. That's where they're starting off here, pre in the blue. But you see a decrease. By, in fact, by the time we got to 216, none of the students thought that. Possibly an indicator that we're moving away from students just blindly accepting that this is the results that we should expect based off of what we, um, what we got in our instructions towards, you know, there's some, there's some gift here and we can think about these things a little more deeply. This is still something that's in development and so this is something we kind of plan on giving just about every fall so we can see if we see any change, not only as they work on this a little more because they have been changing the questions, but to see if these kind of trends are repeatable because again, I said these are small numbers, so I don't know that this is something that we should get every single semester. The thing that's sort of become a research project is that after I realized that uh, students didn't know how to really, by the end of that first year, collect data on their own, was trying to figure out if there's some way that I could test students on my own, some sort of assessment that I could give them pre and post every semester to track how students were doing on the labs. This thing has gone through a couple of different iterations and it's just recently kind of started to find a focus, which is that there's really no way for us to figure out, if we go back a couple of slides, how students think about uncertainty. And I say this is important, especially if we're going to do quantitative prediction, because uncertainty is a really big part of that. There's a big difference between being 2% wrong and 100% wrong, and that's tied to your understanding of uncertainty. So what we're trying to build is basically a way of testing can students do um, this sort of uncertainty propagation and can they make sense of it? So what I've drawn for you is a beautiful onion. And the onion is breaking down the pieces that I think are necessary steps to be able to solve an uncertainty problem. So you have things like, you know, can you solve the problem? Do you know how to compare sources of uncertainty? So do you know how to compare instrumental and say statistical or systematic uncertainties? Do you know how to compare two different sources of uncertainty if you're propagating that uncertainty? Do you even know the formula for uncertainty? And finally, can you do the math? I argue that these steps are all necessary. These pieces are all necessary to even be able to do this kind of problem solving. And I want to know, can students do pieces of this and not be able to do the others? And that's what's limiting their ability to basically overall be able to reason with uncertainty. So the idea is that we have big questions and little questions. And this is an example of a big question that Cato wrote. So this has got um, you know, pressure, gravity, height, and they're asked basically to figure out, I'm sorry, density, gravity, height, and they're asked to figure out what the, um, basically what the largest source of uncertainty in the pressure that they're calculating from this would be. So what's the major source of uncertainty and what do you do next in the experiment? So you have these different sources of uncertainty sitting here and you're given the instrumental uncertainties for each of these things. So you should hopefully spend a little bit of time 
comparing these sources of uncertainty and propagating them through this equation in order to figure out what, um, what your expected uncertainty is and what you expect to be the thing that is affecting you most. Do you co-collect more data on age? Do you go get a better instrument for density? So on. So these little questions then are designed to target some of those steps I mentioned earlier. Do you know how to find a partial derivative? Not all of our students do. They don't know how even how to calculate a partial derivative. And if they can't do that, they'll probably have trouble with the whole problem. Do they know the uncertainty formula? Do they even know what it looks like to propagate uncertainty? And finally, if you give them all of the individual pieces, so they don't even have to do any propagation of, whoa, fix it. If they don't know even how to do, so they don't even know how to do the partial, we just give them this information. Can they compare sources of uncertainty in order to figure out what's happening? So, break this down for you. There's a lot of stuff going on here. This is how well students did, and this is really small sample size. This is just something we're using for the development of ELSA. This is how they do on the big question pre and post. And these error bars are probably actually underestimated because I haven't included um, because we're still working on how to do that, basically the chance of they randomly guessing. So they can go through and just randomly guess. So some of this could be due to them just having to click on the right answer. This is how well they did on that partial derivative question. This is how well they did on basically just IDing the correct uncertainty formula. And this is how well they did on comparing those sources of uncertainty. And you can see for all of these, you know, arguably maybe not that one, but on a lot of these we're seeing some type of gain which is good. This means that they're, this one's really nice. It means they are learning how to compare sources of uncertainty. But they're still not doing any better than they were on that big question. And that is if you look at how they, how they changed in getting all three of these correct, you can see it's still a small fraction. So our students are learning how to do individual pieces of how one might propagate uncertainty. And we can start to tease apart those individual steps so that we can see what kind of things students would probably need to work on for each individual student so that they could do this overall problem better. This is still in the works. We're still trying to m validate this. And so if any of you saw us earlier in this room, earlier in this uh, year, we're still trying to ask students these questions in person so that we can make sure that this is going on. Because if this is, then this will really help us to understand basically what we need to be targeting in our instruction of the students. Part of this ELSA test also has to do with the thing I'm going to talk about next, which is math. Math is everywhere. Um, and for students, this is a sad thing. That's why I've drawn sad spaces. But math is not a trouble just because they don't know, oh, I did it again. Ha. Not just because they don't know how to do math, because if you go back to that slide, you can see they're actually not doing so bad. We're sitting here at you know, 60 to 70 percent. That, that's not bad. 60 to, 60 to 70 percent of our students can do a partial derivative. But it's not just being able to do math. There's this psychological term called transfer. The idea is that if you learn how to do something in one scenario, can you transfer those knowledge and the, that knowledge and those skill sets to a completely different scenario? And it turns out this is much harder to do than we expect. So just being able to do math in a math class does not necessarily mean that those students can do math in their physics classes. We see this a lot in the labs. In fact, if you give them an Ohm's, Ohm's Law lab, which is turning out to be one of my favorites, and you get them to plot the potential applied to a resistor versus the current that they get then from that resistor, it's a line. It's a beautiful line. But if you ask them what is the meaning of that slope, they'll stare at you for a while. They'll stare and like, I don't know, and you write out Ohm's Law and you write out the equation for a line and you start getting the compare terms, they'll start to get it. A lot of that problem is a transfer problem. I do it again, man. It's a transfer problem, which means that we have something here to work on. If you don't believe me, you can look at this study by Evenjack 2015. They gave them three different questions. And this is just an example. They had a bunch of other questions. All of these questions basically require the same amount of math. Find the area under this curve. And the math one is just that. Find the area under the curve. These two, this is velocity versus time. This is some sort of rate of water versus time. And they want to find out what's the distance and what's the amount of water. It's just another area problem. Can you find the area under the curve? Students do great on that first one. 
So this is that top one, this is the middle one, and this is that bottom one. And green means they did it right. They calculate area in the graph. They do great on the math one. They know what to do. But when it comes to applying that math to a physics problem, they have a lot of trouble, and they just start pulling stuff out of nowhere. They just start, oh, we're going to grab that equation that might work here. They're not transferring their math skills to that physics class. And this affects our labs. This affects their ability to calculate uncertainty. This affects their ability to interpret the results. Everything that we're seeing in labs where they're having trouble with math may be small parts due to their trouble with math, but a lot of it could be due to this math transfer issue. Uh, CTE, the Center for Teaching Excellence, gave us a small grant in order to try to improve this in the lab specifically a year or so ago. So this is a flow chart that explains the supplement that we made on Blackboard. Basically, students would be tested on um, some sort of collection of physics problems that were heavily math-based. They do that at the beginning, and we do that at the end, and they go through this sort of process where first we remind them about how math works. Here's how you solve problems with math. And then if they don't do well on that, we just leave them in this sort of limbo where they have to keep trying math problems. Once they pass that, they can move on to the implementation where we try to compare. Here, look, you just did this math problem. Here's the physics question. It's the same thing. Can you squish this together and get it? And if they, um, based on how they do on that, they get stuck in another limbo. We did OK. We didn't do that great. So what you're seeing here is that, that, that at the beginning, that math, uh, at the beginning, the score they got on that, those mathy physics questions versus their post score. And this is one to one, so you would hope that either they're at the line or above the line. These are students that didn't get anything from the supplement, and these are students that got something from it. When we track the students, basically how much through this whole flow chart they made it, how then what normalized gain they got from it. We saw a little bit of gain up through a handful of the sections but not any more of this. And what this is likely indicative of is that this stuff really didn't do much for students. So that means we really still don't know how, at this point, to help students in the lab with their lab transfer skills, something that I would like to keep working on. And in fact, the, the, I don't, yeah. One of the things that we're going to do as a department in the PER group is to really understand how this sort of lab, uh, sorry, this math application um, to astronomy and to the labs and to the classes in general sort of works. That's all I got for y'all. Thank you. <laughs> if you saw anything you didn't like, it's mine. If you saw anything you did like. Questions? Yes. In your estimation, what is the answer to the question posed in the title? What's the point? I want to say I don't know what the point is yet. So if you go, I don't want to go all the way back, but that little balancing thing I'm doing where there's beliefs and there's skills and there's content, I would argue that, and there's still probably work because you can do it. It's always good to replicate that the content argument's done. The argument that most people are making is along skills. They're trying to focus on, well, what skills can we get? That's why you saw that graphic. It's all skills based. I don't know that that's going to be possible. So. Um, there has been, Mind Lab is not the first one to try to focus on skills. Mine's the first one to do really focus on the um, predictions, like making quantitative predictions and making that a hard line. But nobody yet is really arguing, here we found it. This is what's going to get you that gain in skills, which could mean that they can't even teach skills. What I think may be a benefit to it is the thing that I think at a gut level, like if I told you, just destroy all the labs, just they're all gone. I would hope that a lot of us would be like, don't do that. Not just because we have to pay the GTAs for wonderful people, but because at some level, and I can say this having been trained as a theorist, it, it, it means something more to see the data yourself, to go through the process of like, oh, look, it's this beautiful thing in the book, but when you try to do it, it's actually really complicated. I think that's worth something, which means that it could be that the whole point of labs is just that, the change in beliefs about how students see science is doing done, that it does involve failure, that there isn't necessarily this is the answer and you get a gold star for it, that there's this process that you go through of constantly questioning everything that you're doing to try to come up with the best answer that you can so far. Whether or not that's worth the time and money investment is not something I have to decide, but um, at this point, there's arguably some gains in those, those areas. So that, if you had to justify it, that'd be the thing I'd point to at this point. I 
So, so uh, given that the content is not helping students improve their grades in the lecture, mm -hmm. is there any real point in having a physics one lab and a physics two lab rather than some techniques based lab that's independent of the lectures entirely? Students are really set still in this idea about the lab. I mean, we still see it on the, the student reviews. That's one of the biggest complaints I get. Uh, sometimes we get the lectures and the labs to line up in a nice way, and students will congratulate us on this, but when they don't, that's one of the biggest complaints I still get. This lab didn't match up with the lecture. You're supposed to be helping reinforce it. I'm already getting a lot of flack because chemistry and biology don't do labs like this at all, and that does affect how students go through the labs. Arguably, you could completely revolutionize how labs are taught entirely and not have this breakdown. Instead, just basically spend a whole first semester just on what does data mean, you know, like from a deeper meaning sense, and you get them to do it. maybe, but you're really going to have to. That's going to require uh, some time and some effort, just in the sense of it will completely deviate from what student expectations are, which does affect how well things go. It's not a bad idea worth looking. It'd be nice if we had a prep lab, like just a how to deal with some of this, the what are the theoretical aspects of uncertainty? Yeah, that'd be nice. But you, you had a question, is it, uh, and Allison? I basically, had a similar question because it it seems to be decoupling the lecture and the lab, and I'm just wondering, do the students? actually refer it all to the lecture material, say, say your spring experiment. Mm -hmm. This is something that presumably had in the lecture or will have. Now, it depends on how it's sequenced. If they had it in lecture, we think they would approach the lab differently than they, did, they didn't. But are you finding any connection between the lecture and the lab? So in fact, I try to, the, to bring up the Ohm's Law lab, I try to do that lab before I know students have had any circuits at all. Because if they already know, like, oh, because I don't tell them it's a resistor. I'm like, here's a component. You're going to figure out, you're going to apply different potentials to it. Tell me what current runs through it. I don't tell them it's a resistor at all. I don't tell them it's ohmic. And they get this beautiful line, and then I ask the TA, step in, and start writing Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law is already written in their lab manual, but they haven't seen it. So I think sometimes it's actually useful for them to come in, not quite blank slates, but basically they don't know what to expect. Because then I think they do tend to, Students are really capable of being empirically driven, you know, but when they're told this is, this is what you saw in lecture and now you'll see it in lab, they do approach it differently. I don't have a way of quantifying that, but anecdotally, yeah, it makes a difference. Um, so it's part of what's resulted in that is that I have simplified dramatically a lot of our labs. We used to have much more complex labs and I've been trying to break those apart into, um, I would argue, more manageable pieces for students. So students can kind of encompass the whole part of the experiment instead of doing really complex equations that they, they wouldn't have come up with on their own or methods that they wouldn't have come up with on their own. Yeah. Did you still have a question, Allison? Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that for one of the labs you have to do the same thing for three, three labs in a row. That, That's all of them now. That sounds like a bad idea to keep on doing the same thing wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the idea with this, and the TAs, uh, they do provide some help, and I, that's something that I still don't think I'm doing well enough, which is helping the TAs help with those kinds of things, because I, I, I am mean to those TAs about don't tell the students what to do. So like, you'll be tempted to be like, just, just measure this thing a little bit. So um, a lot of it, I'm arguing, should be done through like a Socratic questioning. So like, if you see a student and they say, like the one we just did, the students were told, they were given a spring and a pendulum, and they were told to construct a clock. The TA is going to give them a particular time. It's their job to come up with a clock that will meet that period. A lot of students will get hung up on amplitude for the spring, and they really want to find a relation there. The only way that you can start getting them out of this is through questions, asking them things like, OK, so yeah, you're seeing maybe some random sort of noise basically there. Um, do you have any predictive power with this? Could you give me a clock with a period of, say, 1.4 seconds, given the, the amount of mass that you're using? It's not perfect. They, they, they do sometimes have those experiences that are frustrating, where they're stuck. Um, and that's where the TA's job gets really difficult. How do you pull people out of those kinds of things? Um, I, I don't know that there's always a good answer for that. But 
In general, they know when they've screwed up. Um, after that first lab, if the predictions don't go well, then they have, they have that feedback of, OK, well, I didn't get any of that right. And then they go talk to um, other students in the lab. Hey, did you get this one? What did you do? And they come back the next week. Generally, and the TAs can correct me if I'm wrong, generally a little better off they, than they were the first week. I can, I can see how two weeks make sense, but three weeks. So. Three weeks is when they get tested. So they have two weeks where they're working with a partner. They have the full two hours each of those weeks, and they're, they're doing their experiment. The third week is the test. They work alone for 50 minutes, and they know what their goal is. The TA is going to say for that one, your period is 1.2 seconds. Build me your clock. And they have to work it on their own. That's really useful because a lot of times people mooch off their partners, and they haven't been doing anything. So the test is a nice hard break of that. It also sets a goal for them across all the labs. You know at that third week you're going to be tested on this system under these, this parameter space. It's your job to fill in that parameter space as to how the system works. I love about, uh, about giving them confidence and courage and having them think independently. Um, I, I think, I would propose that uh, <clears throat> nothing else in society encourages people to think independently or to think like physicists. And uh, if that society encourages them to do what they've been told and, and they've gone through years and years of school doing what they're told. Now, when you then say, look, we want you to really uh, think independently, we give it a try. And I think what we don't recognize, uh, because uh, we're so experienced, is that the first time you think uh, independently on a new topic, there's an extremely high density of wrong answers right next to what you're trying to discover. We don't know about that high density of wrong things because we already know the right thing. But it takes forever to go through on your own and find the exactly right concept. Uh, I got this idea when you mentioned the amplitude of the spring. I mean, as far as I know, the amplitude might be the most important deal. Yeah. And it's completely non-obvious. In fact, the spring has been carefully engineered so that the amplitude is, doesn't matter very much. So the, the, there's a huge high density of wrong concepts. And I wonder if there would be some way, some experimental encouragement for them to discover the wrong concepts. It, 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 uh, discovering a wrong concept is wrong is as useful as getting the lab right. I, that's why I specifically mention amplitude. It's one of the, like, I go, I, in the instructions, it talks about you can change the angle of a. Of a but but they, can't, they can't get that from pure thought. And, and, and the experiment is not that easy. Because there's so many, it's, it's a big it's a big space. So it's absolutely a correct, independent thinking experiment or alternative for a student to say, I think the amplitude is really important. I'm going to explore that. Yeah. And they could spend a whole semester exploring it. Yes. But, and, I wonder if there would be some reward system for discovering dead ends. That's a creative idea. You got a great idea. It doesn't work that way. You know? uh, yeah, so one of the things that I did try last fall was I wanted to, st I made the students do forum posts where they would talk about, I tried this and this failed, or I tried this and this worked. They hated it. Um, they didn't do it really well either. So I, I agree. I want them to. Sh I want them to communicate. That's just it. I want them to tell each other, I tried this and it worked or it didn't. Um, I try to build a point system to reward that, and it didn't work. That doesn't mean that there isn't a better way than what I came up with. And if y'all have any suggestions about how to reward those kinds of things, one of the things I'm seeing though is that a lot of times students aren't. They like to keep their uncertainties big, actually because then they're going to get the right answer. I don't know how to combat this yet except for using competition. And I don't want to use competition because that, that, that can be an issue with um, basically minoritized populations. So I, I, don't, I don't know how, how to tackle that. Um, I'm still thinking about it. And again, I'm open to suggestion. I, yeah. I saw Greg and then like. Um, so I know when I taught really basic stuff, I've understood it better, even though I thought I knew it. So I'm wondering, from the GTA perspective, have they found, and they're all behind me right there, have they, have they all found that um, any improvement in their like base level conceptual understanding of the material that they're teaching, or their sense of ability as instructors has changed 
based on the different kinds of methodologies for teaching or the content of the labs? Have you tracked like GTA outcomes at all? No. In fact, that's a project I want to start working on next fall because I try to train the TAs and it's becoming very meta for me because the way I would teach students in the lab is not the same way I need to train the TAs. And I, I, I brought this up at the AAPT that, that everyone's talking about doing these non-traditional labs and these inquiry-based labs and model labs. And I said, how am I supposed to train the TAs for this? Because it's not trivial. In a traditional lab, you give a lecture, you say do this and this and this, and basically how clear you are in delivering those instructions matches with how well students do. But with this, it's way different. You have to be able to pick people's brains apart. And I don't, the TAs can tell you their own personal experiences with it. But when I do it, it's, it's more difficult. It is a lot more difficult to teach this way. Um, and I don't, I don't know that I know the best way to train TAs how to do this yet. Um, I will let them speak as to their own personal, but I have not quizzed them on that yet. I do ask them how terrible the labs were, and they give me their anonymous opinion at the end. But, um, it's a good question. I don't, I'll track it next fall if I can think how to. Just want to say, what John said, I think it's, it's, there's a lot to be said for finding that some, proving that something doesn't make that Yeah. Also, <coughs> just in, in CMS, I could give exactly the same problem. People deliberately inflate their errors for the insurance, insurance policy, which is, which is very irritating. <laughs> That makes me feel a little better, though, that if, if <laughs> the real world hasn't figured out how to fix this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, most of what I've been doing has been trying to cut away things. I'm trying to figure out how simple I can make it, because the more complex I make the labs, the more I get issues like this. And if I, I think if I can, because all these labs are so simple that, that um, you do just have to start thinking about what makes the uncertainty work. Uh, but I don't know that I've scaffolded that well enough so that students feel incentivized to do this. Keep trying. Any other questions? So when you are doing these online tests, are you putting on like window lockers where they can't go elsewhere? Which ones? The ELSA one? Uh, yeah. So. So like uh, when they take the test. Because if they're learning math skills like partial differentials, what I've seen a lot of students do is they'll just go to an online partial uh -huh. differential calculator, copy, and like, all right, here you go. I would hope that they, I mean, I'd hope they'd do better than 70% if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> it could just be that 25 or 30% of our students are honest and, and the rest are not. Uh, no, I don't block them. I, so a lot of this, this, this is, this is becoming research, but most of what I've shown you was done for internal purposes. This is me just trying to, I don't like that the labs aren't doing something. So what, what could they do? And me just saying, well, if I try this, what happens? Um, so there's, until I get this thing nailed down and I get the pieces nailed down of how I even test some of this, at this point, it's, it's kind of me just throwing a dart and saying, Let's, I think this might work. Without measurement tools to actually track changes, I, I don't know. And until I get the, yeah, when I get this developed a little better, then some of that would be useful. I do know, like the Plick, they don't block anything. You can go use whatever you want. It's just an online test that you can take. Same thing for the E class, it's all done online. So, yeah, they could be cheating. So first, I'll share an observation with you that I probably should have observed a long time ago. There is a complete segregation of this <laughs> colloquium. <laughs> all the students are here, with uh, maybe two or three here, and all the faculty are here, with one. Oh, two. Well, yeah. Okay. Stop segregating yourselves. <laughs> anyway, thank you, gentlemen.